All right, so don't forget about the peritoneum and the peritoneal cavity. The reason why we kind of drilled this concept to, uh, home to you multiple times is because it's a hard one to hold on to because you're looking inside the abdomen and the pelvis and you just see space and you see fascia everywhere and it, everything starts to bleed together. But the peritoneum is going to actually segment the abdominal pelvic cavity into an abdominal cavity, everything that is associated with that that you already did in the abdomen and the inferior aspect of the peritoneum which is the pelvic cavity so everything that's below the inferior expansion of the peritoneum so the peritoneum may still be is probably still attached in the pelvic area and draping over the organs like we talked about when we did the introduction so don't forget to have that concept in your brain as you look down into the pelvic cavity before you remove it off and it's gone it's gone for good and it's not very easy to put back on and, and get that appreciation and also hold on to that when you're looking at images and, and try to place that in your mind is there peritoneum in this image or is there not peritoneum has it been removed and that will help you uh, with or your orientation to the pelvic cavity versus the abdominal Okay, so a structure that is going to be in both the male and the females, uh, you've already come in contact with the ureters, and they are in the posterior abdominal wall. They start in the posterior abdominal wall, right, with the renal pelvis, and then they're going to uh, traverse back there, uh, retroperitoneal, behind the peritoneum, you had to lift it up, and you probably have, or hopefully have already, followed the ureters distally uh, down almost to the pelvic brim. The ureters are gonna come over the pelvic brim still staying outside or retroperitoneal not does never do they come into the peritoneum they're going to stay below the peritoneum and they're going to come anteriorly to um, come into the posterior aspect of the bladder okay so the ureters are going to have that course in the male and the female and there there are going to be some relationships that the ureters have with vessels that are clinically important especially in the female that we'll talk about right now actually we'll talk about it right now so in the males uh, the ureter is going to um, come uh, in, inferiorly, it is going to, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I am following the Voss friends with my highlighter. The ureter is going to come inferiorly into the posterior aspect of the bladder, and it's going to tuck just underneath the vas deferens, that is, it, as it comes down to the posterior inferior aspect. Not going to come into the bladder, but it's going to go into the prostatic urethra after it joins up with the seminal vesicles duct. And the reason for this anatomic relationship is because of the developmental process of the prostate and the testes, and which that is going to be described and picked up for you kind of more in, in an illustrative uh, way by uh, uh, Dr. Tabi Manuel and um, myself when we talk about the urogenital development, okay? In females, the ureter is going to come down the posterior uh, abdominal wall, it's going to cross the pelvic brim as well, and it's going to um, traverse posterior to the uterine artery. So the uterine artery is going to come on top of the ureter, and then the ureter is going to actually go on top of another artery called the vaginal artery. So this relationship is pretty consistent, and it's a clinically important relationship if you're trying, if you're in that area and you don't want to disturb the ureter because you don't want to accidentally clamp off the ureter instead of the uterine artery. And so you have to uh, kind of hold that relationship in your head. And um, what the way that the kind of common term is that water runs under the bridge, the bridge being the uterine artery and the water being the ureter, urine in the ureter. Okay, so that's the clinical uh, point that you should look for in lab. Even if you don't have a female cadaver, go over to one that does have one and who that has a uterus and look for that relationship. Okay, so the bladder is a hollow organ. It has a very, very muscular wall. The muscular fibers are oriented in kind of, um, they say it has kind of loosely three layers, but they're, they're really a, a somewhat of an interlocking random orientation. And we'll look at the bladder uh, next semester in um, histology, and you'll be able to see how the muscle uh, fibers kind of are all interspersed together. The muscular wall is called the detrusor muscle collectively. They call that muscle the detrusor muscle. And the bladder is known for its ability to distend 
to constrict down and then just stand up and fill and it's going to um, change position according to how much urine the bladder has in it. And you've already seen these this point when you go walk around the lab, well, or I guess we haven't done the pellets, but we're doing the pellets, you'll see that the bladder will be all different sizes, thinness and thick, and you'll think, oh, this one's got a big bladder. Well, it was just descended, and um, it's not necessarily that um, all of them could be descended to a, a maximum point. And so um, there are the ureteric orifices where the ureters come into the bladder, that is an anatomic point, and then there is an internal urethral orifice where urine is going to leave the bladder. And the bladder has a special lining that has um, a specialized epithelial cells that are going to, is going to protect the lining of the bladder from the contents inside. Okay, and, we'll, and we'll pick that up next semester. All right. And it's associated with um, the rectum posteriorly and uh, anteriorly, and also the uh, vagina in females, and the rectum in a non-uterine pelvis. Uh, and then and posterior, I mean, anteriorly, is going to be connected to the pubic symphysis. There's a small space, a little bit of connective tissue, loose connective tissue there, but is associated with that pubic symphysis anteriorly. Okay, so the position of the bladder, it changes throughout life. Uh, in infants and young children, the bladder ca uh, can come all the way up um, uh, high in the abdomen. And so it's, it, that was sort of, I, I guess I had been teaching anatomy for quite a while before I realized this, this was presented in, the, in your current text in, um, in like a little specialized area that I hadn't read. And so it was sort of surprising to me uh, to think about the fact that the bladder comes, comes really high up in the abdomen in young children and infants. So uh, that was a point that I wanted to point out to you. And even in adults, uh, what they mention in your book is that a completely filled bladder can raise to the level of the navel. Um, which uh, it should help you think about if you ever do need it to come and approach the bladder. There are more than one ways to get to it. You can come uh, superior to the pubic symphysis to um, the word I'm looking for, not, not to approach, to approach the bladder instead of necessarily having to come through the urethra. And so that, that's sort of an interesting anatomic point for me uh, that has clinical implication. Okay, uh, so the, part, the bladder has uh, different parts to it, and uh, the parts aren't necessarily um, intuitive, I think, because of the fa fact that the bladder is situated to where the apex is facing the pubic symphysis. So the apex is facing the pubic symphysis here. It has a, uh, the body would be the main bulk of the organ, and then the fundic region, which is the posterior inferior rounded portion here, which is directly in opposition to the area where the apex is. And then the bladder is going to funnel down into the a neck, which is going to be continuous with the urethra. So those are just being, if you're being able to describe where lesions are located at or um, uh, various things that you see on medical imaging, this is the anatomic orientation. Okay, and then some uh, other parts that I mentioned to you just a second ago is that there are ureteric orifices and that there is an internal um, urethral orifice that is here where it's continuous with the urethral and in males there is an internal urethral sphincter that uh, will actually contract to prevent retrograde um, uh, movement of sperm into the bladder from the urethra during ejaculation. Okay. And the area that is caused, this yellow area that's caused by interlocking these anatomic points is called the trigone and so uh, which is an area where you can get um, uh, more common get infections. And so uh, that, these are important anatomic points on the inside of the bladder, not just the outside there. Okay. We talked about parts of the male urethra when we did the perineum. So we talked about the spongy part of the urethra that was also called this penile, and then the membranous that's also called the intermediate part that goes to the pelvic floor. But there are um, also two other parts. There's the prostatic part, so it's going to be the part that goes through the prostate, prostate gland here, and then not really well, not really depicted on this image. There is a pre-prostatic part that will um, be a small little part of the urethra, just inferior to the prostate when the bladder is, is uh, less full, so it's more empty, and then you have a little bit of, bit of, of urethra that is going to be external to the internal urethral sphincter. Okay. And the female, it's not segmented into different parts. The female urethra is more distensible than the male urethra. 
and, uh, and, and it is also considerably shorter usually, and that is why the female is more likely to get bladder infections than, than the male because of the close proximity of the urethra to the external environment and also how distensible the urethra is in the female. It allows for uh, microbes to get into and um, pathogens to get into the bladder easily or uh, urethral infections to spread faster. Okay. Oh, did, I hope you all hooked up your, did it, did you all hook up your, your uh, turning point? No? Ne yes? Anybody need the session number? Yes, some people do. 370-789. Thank you. I'm going to read my question. Which of the following pelvic organs is most susceptible to injury when traction is applied during surgical procedures? <laughs> All right, maybe not the best wording, but hopefully you understand what I'm trying to ask. You, which one of these uh, structures do you think might be more delicate? Poll is open. I have 12 responses. Thank you. Let me make a guess. It's okay. Yes. Uh, how do I just, is pulling back with the, yeah. yeah, just pulling it back during a surgical procedure. The organ? Oh, okay, okay. I, that's my understanding. I could have it wrong. I, I, I think, I think of it as holding back an organ so that you can do a surgical procedure. Yeah. With either an instrument or, in this case, it could be an instrument or not an instrument. Okay, so you're asking which organ is the most Yeah, yeah. That's which one's the most fragile. Like I said, maybe not the best wording. It's not an exam question. I'm just, uh, it was one in the morning. <laughs> I'm not, this was, this is the last thing I do is read all those clinical boxes. I'm like, well, that's cool, but I don't know how to word this. All right, let's see what the answer is here. <laughs> all right, most of you put the ureter, and you would be correct from this list if this is a very hypothetical general answer question. Now, the whole reason why I brought this up, though, is to explain that the ureter has these long vessels that uh, traverse the length of the ureter, and, they, they rely, and they're fragile, and they come from multiple sources. When you read the blood supply to, if you read the blood supply to the ureter, you'll see that it's coming from lots, little branches from lots of different places. And these long anastomoses that occur can be di uh, disrupted when you apply traction to the ureter. Um, so it's a very fragile um, organ. And what they talk about in the clinical box is if you disrupt the blood supply, you're not necessarily going to know it right away, um, kind of like the myocardium. If you have a heart attack, the person might, not, might survive the heart attack. But what happens is that then the wall loses blood supply, and that part of the ureter is going to become necrotic and it eventually ruptures. And, and so you may not know right away, but after a few days, if the ureter ruptures, then um, that's going to be a, a big issue. Okay, so that's why I was bringing that up. Sorry about the wording. Okay, the rectum. The rectum is the part of the GI tract that's in the pelvic cavity, the rectum. And um, it is going to have an inferior dilated portion called the ampulla. And as the sigmoid colon turns, uh, turns inferiorly and the rectum, uh, that part of the GI tract is uh, it turns into the rectum, what happens is that the tinea coli along the sigmoid colon are going to spread out and make this big layer of smooth muscle all the way around the rectum. Okay. And so it is uh, uh, going to be the part of the GI tract just superior to the pelvic diaphragm, the puborectalis muscle that is slinging around this rectum and allowing it to hold a considerable amount of fecal matter before evacuation. And after the rectum courses through the puborectalis muscle on the other side of the pelvic diaphragm, now we're in the anal canal. Okay. So like a lot of those words are used interchangeably throughout your life. You've heard of rectum and anal canal and anus and all of that stuff. But hopefully now anatomically, you're thinking about where that particular word is in the body. Okay. 
And so uh, I put, give you a little extra information there for your reading if, in case you're not reading the textbook. And don't forget to think about that. Where does that sigmoid colon, you can see the tenia coli spread out in that the, the um, serosal lining around the rectum, it, it's different than the rest of the colon. Okay? And also the epiploic appendages stop um, and uh, we don't have hostra like we do in the rest of the colon. Okay, so the pelvis has a lot of neurovasculature that we talk about, um, that we're going to talk about. Um, the internal iliac artery is going to be the na main neurovascular uh, vascular structure and vein in the pelvis. So it has an artery, it has veins, a lot of the arterial branches are similarly named to the veins. And so here we have the situation where this iliac, the aorta branched into this, these common iliac arteries. The iliac arteries branch into an internal and external. The internal goes into the pelvis to, oops, to do all of that, all the organs and the wall and the muscles and everything that, that needs to supply in the external iliac artery is going to continue into the lower extremity. And so that's the anatomic situation that we're in. Unfortunately, I hate to break it to you, you probably already know, but you're going to have to find all these branches. So um, instead of going through all of these branches and this branch comes off and it's going to go here and it has this relationship, which would take me 20 minutes that I don't have, what I did is it's super important and, and it is really well described in your dissector. But I have a little tangent here in the lecture, a little link, and it goes through uh, the anterior division, all the branches, and each artery, posterior division here, and each one, and it tells you uh, how you can find the different branches, it points them out for you, okay? And then you can go back to the lecture and you can continue that on. So you don't have to look at it right now, but you want to look at it later. And maybe you just read the dissector and you say, forget about that. I don't, it doesn't matter to me, but the information is here for you, okay, to help you out. All right, there are pelvic veins. There are pelvic, uh, the internal iliac artery has similarly named veins for the most part that are going to, the, I did t in the tangent, it tells you about a couple exceptions that are going to course uh, along with the arteries, all right? But um, on the walls of the organs, the veins make really nice plexi, plexi that are going to drain blood from each of the organs. And they have the names like uh, prostatic plexus, um, vaginal plexus, uterine plexus. And so you can read about those in a textbook or you can see them in lab. They're not, they don't have all these branches that you need to know, but the concept needs to be there, how blood gets back into the iliac, um, internal iliac vein, and then back, you know, back to the um, inferior vena cava. All right, but see, look at these, look at the walls of the organs, so check out the venous plexus, although you're not going to have to necessarily point each of them out and name them. Okay. Um, oh, I, I wanted to say one more thing about this. I, I, I made this, this slide here, talks about the rules. Uh, so although I'm not going through all of them, here are some rules, like where they, where they are situated at, um, that the nerves are going to be medial, um, the vascular structure is going to be medial to the nerves. So, so these are just some rules to help you kind of orient it in your mind. Because although you're learning all these little uh, parts, they are, they are organized. They're clumped together and organized anatomically. And so I just made this for you because it helps me to, to compartmentalize where the nerves are in comparison to the arteries and the veins. And you'll see these relationships today or Monday in lab when you look in here. Okay. All right. So now we have some female internal organs. So for a uterus-containing female, uh, we have some organs that we haven't really talked about yet. So here you can see the entire female genital tract. We already talked about the vulva or the, or the pudendum. And then so here we're going to have the, uh, the vagina, the uterus, the uterine tubes, and the ovaries to talk about. All right, don't forget about uh, the peritoneum. The peritoneum is draped over these female internal organs. Uh, and is going to actually uh, make a supporting ligament that will help stabilize the uterus, uterine tubes, and ovaries, okay? And so remember I talked to you about how we have a special situation with the ovaries and the ovum of, um, of, of where we have something going on with the peritoneal cavity and these structures. So I made this uh, funny, fun story, the story of the ovum and the peritoneal cavity for you. 
I have no life, I know. But <laughs> so we have an ovary, okay? So we have an ovary, right? Just, just bear with me here. And then we have a uterine tube that's somewhat connected to the ovary. It actually has a really long fimbriae that is actually connected to the ovary. Uh, and so this is where the uterus is. So this is lateral and this is medial. All right. Now, we have the peritoneum that's draped over the ovary and the uterine tube. And so that means that this is inside the peritoneal cavity and this is inferior to the peritoneum or the pelvic cavity. Okay? All right, here we go. I forgot what, what highlight I just clicked. Not that, okay, click that one. Now, the epithelium of the ovary, so it, it actually, the, I mean, the peritoneum undergoes apoptosis during development to where it's just the ovary outer epithelium, which is just a simple cuboidal epithelium. They call it germinal, but it's not the part of the ovary that has the germ cells. It breaks down, the peritoneum breaks down, so you just are left with this thin epithelium around the ovary. Huh, okay. So when an ovum gets released from the ovary, as it gets, it ruptures, follicle ruptures, and the ovum comes out, it is in the peritoneal cavity, briefly. Right, yeah, we're following this. And then the cilia inside the uterine tube are beating and like, pulling it in, pulling it in, the secretions and beating, and it's making this almost slight suction to bring the ovum into the uterine tube. So nothing's in the peritoneal cavity except for briefly an ovum. Okay? All right. That was my attempt. You can watch it multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the uterine tubes are located here. This is, I want to orient you to the point, fact that this is a posterior view. So when I show you, and any time you're looking at this kind of view where you're seeing ovaries, you're looking at the back side of the uterus, the posterior from the back towards the front, okay? The ovaries don't hang in the front, they hang on the back side. And uh, so the uterine tubes are going to sit on the superior rim of this double draped peritoneum that's on top of the uh, female internal organs here, okay? And so you can see the uterine tubes are connected to the uterus. They extend laterally and end here in this, the infundibulum. So here I have the different parts. The infundibulum is the most lateral. They have really long finger-like extensions called fimbriae. Uh, the uterine tube, for the most part, has the same type of cells on the inside of the uterine tube um, all, in all of its length, but these are in just the anatomic points. If you move more medially towards the uterus, the next part of the uterine tube is called the ampulla. It's the widest and longest part of the uterine tube. Fertilization usually occurs if it's gonna occur in the ampulla of the uterine tube. The next part of the uterine tube is called the isthmus, and that part is going to be most medially, to almost all the way to the uterus, actually. And when you're looking at a cross-section, the walls are getting really thick and more muscular. The, and they're still the same epithelium, but the walls are getting thicker, okay? And then there is a very short intramural part of the uterine tube where it actually goes through the wall of the uterus and then now, now the opening is continuous with the uterine cavity. And this is just a little quiz where you can click and you can quiz yourself on the parts. Okay, the ovaries. The ovaries are the female gonads. So they are going to make the ovum and you'll learn about this in different ways in different classes. They uh, usually lie here on the posterior part of this uh, per double peritoneal layer that's called the broad ligaments. They also secrete hormones, so they don't just um, release ovum, they also secrete hormones that are important for maturation and um, health in the female, okay? And you'll talk about, we're gonna talk more about the development and all of that. All right, so that double layer of peritoneum that's draped over the female organs is called the broad ligament. We just call it the broad ligament um, you know it's, per you, I mean, I'm trying to reinforce to you that it's peritoneum. It's a double layer. In some places, it's completely adhered to the other side, okay? 
And I just drew in here a little illustration so you could see where the pelvic floor would be. So this broad ligament is going to come on the pelvic floor and then reflect up, right? Yeah, it's going to reflect up because it's not going this way. It does not, peritoneum is not going to line the pelvic floor because that's in the pelvic cavity and that's below the peritoneal cavity. It's going to come up because it's in the abdomen and it's making that peritoneal sac. Okay, um, and so this is going to be the most superior part, the peritoneum is going to wrap around these uterine tubes and then, so this is one side and you can't see the other side, but it's on the other side. Now, the broad ligament has different names and they're just regional names. Most of the part of the broad ligament inferior to where the uterine tubes are located, all of that big part is just called the uh, me mesometrium. I forgot there for a minute. The mesometrium. So most of it that you're looking at, that you can hold, and you can wiggle the uterus back and forth, and you can see that all of this is the, me the mesometrium. That was the easy part. Now, the other parts of the broad ligament are a little more tricky. So you want to take some time to look at this in lab, because the only time you can really, I, I found the best picture I could find, but it's still a hard to, thing to um, think about. All right, so this uh, figure is this part, kind of, over here. So uh, we're looking at the uterine tube, here's the fimbriae uh, on the ovary, here's the ovary, and so it's cut, and we're looking from medial to lateral. And we can see the mesometrium coming up, and there, where the mesometrium extends from the ovary to the uh, uterine tube, that is called the mesosalpinx. This little portion is called the mesosalpinx. It's in the same plane that the mesometrium is in. But then you have a perpendicular section that is going to extend off of the mesometrium and mesosalpinx, and it's going to connect to the ovary. And it's perpendicular. It's in a perpendicular plane. It's not very long. It's very short. When you hold the ovary out, it's going to be connecting the ovary to the rest of that broad ligament. And that's called the mesovarium. Okay, so find this relationship. You can only really see it in lab. We got the picture, but it still doesn't do it justice. Okay, in the broad ligament, you have, so if you think about it, if, the, if the, the broad ligament is a peritoneum coming up and draping over the organs, and the neuro, the neuro, yeah, well, neurovascular lymphatics, all of that is coming to the organs on the posterior abdominal wall behind the peritoneum, and then they have to come down and they have to come over to the ovaries. They're going to be in that broad ligament between those two layers. That part of the broad ligament that those vessels, nerves, lymphatics are coursing in is called the suspensory ligament. It's, it's just an anatomic part. That part, you feel, you'll feel it. You'll feel the thickening where the vessels are running through. That's called the suspensory ligament. It's running from the lateral wall of the pelvis and coming towards the ovaries. So you can find it at the ovaries and go backwards, whichever you want to do. Okay. And then there's two other ligaments that are associated with the organ. One's gonna be, you can see from the posterior side, and the other one you can see on the anterior side. These are associated with the ovary and the uterus. So the ligament of the ovary, ovary is on the posterior side, attaching the ovary to the uterus. So you can find this thickening connective tissue band that is attaching the, the ovary to the uterus itself, okay? And then on the, if you're looking anteriorly, oh, I was supposed to, Oh, no. Oh, crap. Well, I messed that one up. So which of the following can be palpated by the rectal examination? Which of the following do you think could be palpated if you're doing a rectal examination? And I purposely didn't put prostate up there. Ah. It's not open yet, but it's opening. It's going to work. I know. Come on. Oh. Oh, wait. I did this. It just, it just did this. Okay, hold on. Let me just do this thought. Think about what your answer was. What was I saying? Okay, so on the anterior view, you can see the round ligament of the uterus. 
that, that round ligament that came through that inguinal canal in females is going to come around and attach on the anterior side. Okay, so find that too. Don't just find it in the inguinal canal. Follow it all the way down. Okay, so if you're, and you find all of these points, the suspensory ligament, find the round ligament, find the ligament of the ovary, look for the mesometrium and the mesosalpinx and the mesovarium. Okay? Now, which of the following can be palpated by the rectal examination? The pull is open, magic occurred, so you can put your response in. Okay, make your guess. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, most people put a rectouterine pouch tumor. That's correct. Fantastic. So they all could actually, I know, I'm sorry. I know you hate me for this, but, but I like reading these boxes. And, and, I, and I, I try to point out things that surprise me because people say prostate over and over and over again. But in the textbook, um, they, make a, they have a whole box and they, they point out all of these things as possibilities for uh, structures. And, and some of these are pathologic. If, if the, you have a, an appendix that's just in the right place, that's really inflamed. Well, you're not going to be going in there just looking for the appendix. But so I, I kind of wanted to point this out. But don't forget to read about these boxes. And this was kind of surprising to me uh, to find that all of these structures could be, in certain situations, palpated by a rectal examination. Although the prostate is, is the one that we talk about, in the vagina, that I didn't put that. There were more. I didn't put all of them up here. Um, there are other ones that you can feel during that kind of examination. OK. The uterus. So the uterus is also a hollow organ, but it has a really thick muscular wall. Okay, so it usually has a smaller cavity. It's not as this, but no, it is this sensible. Uh, it does descend in certain situations, like pregnancy, but um, for the most part, it has a very thick muscular wall, and it is going to lie between the urinary bladder and the rectum. And so you can see it positioned here. And so the muscular walls will um, change if you do have pregnancy, and I think that one's kind of uh, definitely easier to understand in regards to expansion of the fetus and responding to fetal growth. But the muscular walls change in the epithelium also change regularly in response to hormones. So it's very associated with the endocrine system. And that will be explained in great detail in physiology and we're going to talk about it in histology as well. Okay. All right, and so here you can see a figure of the uterus. So the, the uterus is huge. It, it gets very, very big and, and, um, because the cells are made of, of their smooth muscle cells, which means they can replicate. So um, that is sort of a, a nice uh, quality of the, the cell type. And you can see then, like in this situation, although the uterus gets large in regards to the organ's volume, the walls are much thinner than they were when in a non-pregnant uterus that was more constricted. Okay. And then, and certainly the cavity is changing in its size as well. Now, um, the normal position of the uterus is going to be antiverted and anti-flexed. And so usually the uterus is sitting in regards to um, the vagina and the cervix is what those terms are, are giving the reference for. And so the uterus is usually sitting on top of the bladder when the bladder is empty. And so that's, and that's not always a situation. There are lots of variabilities in the uterus shape, size, and the way that it's positioned in the female pelvis. But this is just the typical presentation. Okay. And you can see that in this figure over here. And lots of, so when you're looking at a mid-sagittal section of the female pelvis, uh, this is sort of the most typical uh, representation that you're going to see. The uterus has different parts. It has the body, which is all of the green. Um, the fundus is the darker green between the openings of the uterine tubes into the uterus. Uh, and then here it has the isthmus where you have this constricted portion right before you get to the most distal aspect, which is called the cervix. Okay. 
Here you can see the cervix. The cervix um, is the just below the con where it constricts down, and it is uh, fibrous, very fibrous, and that is the part of the uterus that is going to dilate during labor and allow for uh, childbirth to occur. And so you can usually feel the where the cervix is when you're palpating the uterus because it's really, really tough and hard, um, and so you can you can feel the difference in the organ when you get down to the uterus. Now, the cervix is going to extend into the vagina, and there are going to be recesses around the cervix. The cervix is like a circle, looks kind of like a circular donut, and there is a recess in the vagina that extends up on the walls of the cervix that um, are called fornices. Okay, so there are um, vaginal fornix, and you'll see this mentioned in the dissector, and they'll tell you to look for these spaces, and that's just where the vagina extends up further than the cervix, the external os of the cervix, and the, that, those are the fornices, anterior, posterior, and lateral, okay? So the wall of the uterus, you've probably already uh, heard this, but I just want to make sure I don't assume that anyone um, has this information. The parametrium is the outermost part of the uterus, and that is the covering or the serosa of the uterus, and usually you know, it's parts of the uterus is going to involve the peritoneal covering as well. The middle layer is the thickest layer, and it's called the myometrium, and that is going to have most of the smooth muscle cells, and that, so that's the part that's going to change in size and sensibility, and the smooth muscle cells are going to replicate. It, they, in response to hormones. But it's not the only part um, that uh, replicates the, the internal um, part will change in response to hormones as well, quite a bit. Um, and then, so you have the rhythmic uterine contractions that occur during pregnancy, but you know, I mean, most of the time you're not, I'm not most of uh, the female's life you don't just spend pregnant. So you also can have these uterine contractions of the myometrium just in the regular menses, in the regular menstrual cycle. And then the innermost portion is called the endometrium. This is going to be the part that's going to change uh, quite a bit in response to hormones just on a regular cycle. It has, there are lots of glands and arteries that are contained in the endometrium. And most of the endometrium, not all of it, but most of it will be shed regularly during the menstrual cycle. All right. Um, and then I just wanted to remind you, you've already sort of looked at the um, ovarian artery that is coming down off of the aorta. And so now you're going to continue. This is not a structure that's going to go away. It's going to continue down to the ovary. But we also have blood supply that's going to come from the internal iliac artery. We have a uterine artery and a vaginal artery, both of which are going to be very important in creating anastomosis with the ovarian artery and blood flow to the uterine tubes, the ovary, the uterus, and the vagina. Um, and so you don't forget to find that suspensory ligament where the ovarian vessels are coming over in the broad ligament. And I would like for you also to take a look at this really crazy picture for a minute because it's not really ever well demonstrated in lab. Um, you're going to be finding the uterine artery, which is uh, depicted here uh, on this slide, coming off of internal iliac. Here you can see the ovarian coming down from the aorta. And then this is the vaginal artery coming over. But this is what we're talking about when we're talking about communications of vessels. Communi that there, there's, you, sometimes it's just hard to find out where the bleeding's coming from. Or if you have a disruption in a vessel, that you can have communication from these other vessels that will help supplement. So collateral, these circulation, collateral circulation that is occurring, super important, especially for the female internal organs. Yes? What happens to the uterine vessels when they have a hysterectomy? Uh, clamp them off? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Clamp them off. I'm so glad Dr. Campos is up there to back me up on that. I mean, that just makes sense to me, but just it's, it's a fantastic thing. Okay. Um, now, the, the, the vagina is going to be the extension down inferiorly from the cervix and the uterus. And so the vagina actually started about mid mid cervix because the cervix extends into the vagina. And then it's going to go through the perineum and empty into the external environment that might not have been an open into the external environment. Generally in life, the vagina is a collapsed space. 
And so all you see in pictures is that this is open too, but it's not the way that it is uh, in real life. It's you generally a collapsed space that's um, collapsed anterior posteriorly. And so here you can see that it extends. It's going to open into the vestibule of the vagina along with the um, greater and lesser vestibular glands and the uh, urethra. Okay. Uh, the functions of the vagina, I, I think that... Um, um, it is going to be the organ for some types of sexual intercourse, it is going to be the communication route between the uterus and the external environment for feces, um, feces, <laughs> menses, menstrual fluid to uh, leave the body, and um, also a way that semen can get up into the uterus and the fallopian tube for fertilization to occur. Um, and then also the vagina is the route for the baby to get from the uterus into the world. And so it is the birth canal, part of the birth canal. Okay, and so, um, and the, here I have just highlighted to you, or to have them highlighted, um, so you can really appreciate the associations that the vagina has with the urinary bladder and the rectum. Everything is very close together. So here you can see the urethra here. Um, the urethra in the female um, doesn't have an internal urethral sphincter, and actually even the, the external urethral sphincter is conical in shape. And so it's, it's the completely different kind of muscular situation than the male pelvis. Um, and they have extensive amount of information in the textbook. If you're really interested in this area, that you might want to read that, and that will help give you a different uh, point of view that I don't have necessarily time to go into. Um, and then I like this picture because it shows you a little bit uh, a different view of the fornix. So don't forget to look for the fornixes um, that extend up alongside this. And this is sort of the view you'll see when you do your dissections in lab, will be a cut like this. Okay. All right. Um, the textbook uh, and it goes into um, the elaborations on the different types of muscles that the female has in this area. And I, I didn't talk, some of them which lie in the deep pouch, but I didn't bring them up there because I, I had this time here to do it. So the, um, there are these slips of muscles that some of which you're already familiar with, like the external urethral sphincter and the bulbospongiosis. But two that you're not, um, uh, the pubovaginalis, this is just some um, condensed muscle that runs from the pubic symphysis to the vagina, um, and the urethrovaginal sphincter, which is depicted here in purple that wraps around the vaginal wall. The vagina has a lot of muscle in the wall, but these are muscles from other places that connect to the muscle in the vagina. And these sphincters help compress the vagina, okay? And, and so I kind of give you, this is sort of the skinny on the, on the topic, but I do want you to understand that we have a lot more muscular connections in this area in the female than we do um, in the male. Okay. Yes. Is the pubovaginalis paired on either side of the body? I think it's continuous. It's just one, from my understanding of reading, that it's one continuous thing. So do they call them two? I don't know, but I didn't, I didn't get that impression. Okay, the male internal genital organs. So uh, the testes start internal, and I know that they're housed externally, but we're going to just uh, talk about them for one second. The epididymis is, is um, going to be part of the testes, or it's going to actually be the communication between the testes, storage, and maturation site, and then going to bring the sperm into the vas deferens. The vas deferens is going to come into the body and um, connect to the prostatic urethra along with the opening of another major gland called the seminal vesicle. And you're going to find these uh, when you're doing your dissections in lab. Okay. Um, also the prostates and bulbar urethra glands, we've kind of alluded on them, but we're going to talk more about them right now. All right, I just wanted to give, I know you already talked about the test, but I just want to give you a couple anatomic points just to make sure that uh, some people asked me to do this, and I want to make sure that we're all clear. Um, the test is, is going to uh, be depicted here, and it's going to be made up of lots of small tubules called seminiferous tubules that are segmented by septa that extend uh, in, through the walls, and it's going to compartmentalize these testes. 
this, each testicle. And the seminiferous tubules are going to empty into this very dense network that's called the reti testes. You can see this grossly. It's a gross structure that you can see in lab when you section the testis. And then the reti testes are going to bring the secretions and the sperm into the efferent ductules, these larger ductules that are going to empty into the epididymis. The epididymis is a highly coiled organ, highly coiled that looks like it's not even a bunch of tubes, but it, it is, but all the tubes are connected to each other. And the tubes are going to lead to the, the uh, vas deferens, which is depicted here, which is going to go all the way to where the, pro um, uh, where the prostate is, the prostatic urethra. The epididymis is the major site for storage and maturation of the sperm that were made by the seminiferous tubules. The sperm don't swim in the male, they're brought along through the male reproductive tract by secretions. The epithelium also have cilia that are going to beat and they're going to move the sperm along. They don't swim in the male. Okay, and the epididymis, where you may have looked at or you haven't looked at yet, has a head, it has a body, and it has a tail. And the tail is going to be continuous with the vas deferens. The vas deferens is a cord-like structure. It's very muscular, has a really high ratio of muscle in the wall compared to epithelium, which is kind of unusual. Some of these other ducts that we look at, or you will be looking at, have a lot thicker epithelium than they do a muscular wall. So the vas deferens, you can feel, you can palpate. When you're feeling the spermatic cord, you can find the vas deferens. It feels like a stereo wire because of the muscle being so thick in the wall. Okay, and it's going to come into the pelvic cavity and tra traverse all the way to the inferior aspect of the bladder. Um, and so I want to talk to you a minute about the path of this vas deferens. So you're hopefully starting to look um, at the pelvis uh, this way. So you're looking down from the abdomen, or at least you have been. And so I want to show you now the peritoneum. So you're looking at peritoneum on top of the pelvic organs, right? So think about right now, just think about where is that deep inguinal ring and where is that vas deferens? Because you can see it here. Can you find it? Yeah, no, not sure. Okay, it's okay. I'm not sure either. No. So here you can see the, the area of the deep ring and the vas deferens. But you're not looking at them because the peritoneum's on top. What does that mean? The vas deferens doesn't pierce through the peritoneum, right? It pierces through the transversalis fascia, but it stays inferior to the peritoneum. Another concept of peritoneum, I just want to lay this down. So when you're looking, looking for this, find it today, find the vas deferens coming through, but it's going to be underneath the peritoneum. Okay. All right, so the, the uh, vas deferens ends at a dilated portion just as it meets the area between the prostate and the bladder called the ampulla. It's just a little dilated portion of the, you'll find it, you can feel it in, in, in lab today, and it will be right next to the, another uh, male reproductive gland called the seminal vesicle. Okay, And that we're going to talk about right now. The seminal vesicle is a major uh, male reproductive gland that is going to make lots of secretions because the inside of the seminal vesicle to me it has so much epithelium doesn't have as much muscle inside it looks like a sea fan it's just got so so many glands um, inside and not as much muscle as um, the prostate has and so you're going to palpate this structure you'll probably find both of them and that find the vas deferens coming medially coursing on top of the ureters and coming medially and joining together here because they both the ducts of both of these um, structures come together and form the ejaculatory duct and so when you look at this slide here you can see where the seminal vesicle is and you can see the vas deferens the dilated ampulla aspect and the ducts join to form the ejaculatory duct and the ejaculatory duct is going to open up inside the prostatic urethra on an area that's called the urethral crest and that we'll talk about this in development and on both sides of the urethral crest you have a little tiny opening for the ejaculatory ducts I have found these in lab uh, not all the time um, but they're pretty small but you can find them and uh, it's just sort of interesting so that at this point at that point where it opens into 
The prostatic urethra is where you have all of the secretions from the male come together. Prostatic secretions come in and secretions from the seminal vesicle, and you have the sperm and secretions coming from the testes right here. All right, the prostate. The prostate is an, the other major uh, male reproductive gland. It is more fibromuscular, so parts of it are fibrous. They have lots of fibers and connective tissue, and then it has a lot of muscle as well, as compared to uh, like the seminal vesicle, which is mainly a lot of glands and not quite as fibromuscular. Um, and it's going to be located immediately inferior to the bladder. So it's adjacent to the bladder, and it's going to house the first part or second part, depending on what you, which sex you're reading, of the male urethra. Okay. And so you can see that depicted here. All right, so I want to just want to point out that the prostate has relationships with the rectum posteriorly, which is why you can do a rectal exam to feel for the size and shape and consistency of the prostate. Anteriorly, it's going to have a relationship with the pubic symphysis and superiorly with the bladder. Okay. So the prostate ha is um, described anatomically in a few different ways. It can be just divided on the most simplistic part into lobes, into right and left lobes of the prostate. You could see the reason why they're colored this way is that they're showing you the part of the prostate, these right and left lobes here, that have most of the glandular tissue. The isthmus, which is the anterior medial aspect of the prostate, is mainly fibromuscular. It has almost no glandular tissue in it. And so it's not the glandular tissue, that epithelium, is replicating and turning over and making secretions. That's the tissue that you might have trouble with when it comes to hypertrophy or uh, tumors. Not the fibromuscular isn't, isn't turning over as much, and so you're not, you don't have as much um, uh, risk there. Okay? And in the posterior aspect, posterior medial aspect, there is a, just a small central furrow that exists. Now, um, the, each lobe can now be anatomically, and your book goes uh, into this even in more detail, into lobules. And it's just the anatomic description of the different glandular parts of the prostate. And so some of them are shown uh, here in this, in this image here. And what I want to point out is that the supermedial super medial lobe and the anteromedial lobe is going to be, you can only see the superior medial lobe, but that's depicted here between the prostatic urethra and the ejaculatory duct. And those used to be called the median lobe. Um, and this is how they're described anatomically now. This part of the prostate is the part that um, commonly undergoes hormone-induced hypertrophy and, and creates benign um, uh, prostatic hypertrophy, and it's, it's a very high percentage of males that have this occur. I think it's up in the 80s, um, yeah, up in the 80 percentile, and increases with age. Okay. And this is a picture where um, I'm trying to illustrate, actually Netter is illustrating to you benign hepatic, uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, and um, that, and you can kind of get that impression. This is the superior medial aspect, right? And when we were looking at this slide, uh, so this, uh, this is the part here that would be hypertrophying and coming up into the bladder, and that's what you're looking at here in this section. So here you can see the prostatic urethra right here. This is the other aspect of the prostate. This is where they're getting their vascular supply, and then you have that superior medial aspect that's hypertrophying. And that can cause obstruction of uh, urine or difficulty with urination if, because it could be blocking the um, orifice for urine to leave the bladder. And, and it's not hard to understand that in this picture. And I, there, are some there are treatments for it. Okay. So um, now, the last part of way to look, and this is a part that um, uh, radiologists or um, ultrasonographers, which, which is where um, the textbook brings you to, um, talked about the... Prostate, prostate anatomy, I guess my, my brain and mouth connections are starting to shut off. The, here you have the anterior uh, muscular zone, that fibromuscular area that's depicted here, and you can see it here in this ultrasound. And then it's described, the rest of the prostate is described as having peripheral zones, the peripheral zones, and a central zone here. And uh, there has been a lot of research to show that these peripheral zones are more uh, common, 
or more prone uh, to having cancer and tumors. And so here, as you can see, this in an ultrasound. So that's how it's described, not kind of basic anat anatomic from an anatomist point of view, but more uh, uh, clinician and uh, ultrasonographer, at least. Okay, so where would the spread of prostatic cancer be likely to occur due to communications with the prostatic venous plexus? And we didn't really go into too much of venous return, but I wanted to point this out because it is a clinically applicable thing the textbook talks about. Open, pull, open. Hmm. This one's not waking up for me. Okay, that's okay. Um, anybody have a guess? The kidney. The kidney, okay, good. Any, any other ones that might be? The spine, why would you say that? Because of the, what, what plexus is in the, uh, the sacral spine. All right, all right. I like your, your train of thought here. Let's see if I can get this to advance. The, though the computer's thinking. Okay, so uh, this, <laughs> I was thinking, uh, I just gonna keep going, I guess. Okay, so the spine initially, and then the brain would be the two different um, or most common areas. I mean, certainly when you have metastasized cancer, cancer is going to, can spread to lots of places through lymphatics and the vascular system, especially the lungs and the liver because they're both filters of the vascular system, so cells can get caught in those areas. But in, in this instance particularly, communications with the, of the prostatic, the prostatic venous plexus doesn't only go up through the iliac to the inferior vena cava. It also communicates with the internal vertebral venous plexus. And since there's no valves in those veins, the, any tumor cells that could retrograde go, you know, go through this drainage pass, uh, not retrograde, but it's, it's taking its normal course through this passageway can go up into the internal uh, vertebral venous plexus and then go even all the way up into the brain. So that's just sort of a, a clinically applicable point that is usually brought up about prostate cancer and the routes of metastasis. Now, this is not the only route and it's not the only place that you're probably going to find them, but it is something that you need to be aware of. And we're going to talk about this, these types of communications with veins that don't have valves as we keep going throughout the rest of the course because it's not the only time that this is relevant. Okay, right on the dot. All right, now you have another lecture today. Uh, Dr. Tabi Manuel is going to talk to you about um, the development of the ur urinary system. So what, did they get 10 minutes? or? Okay, you get five minutes. Thank you very much.